So today I'm going to be sharing, like I said, some of the research that I've been working on over the last five years. And the way that I frame this is designing privacy and security resources to teach core concepts to children and families. And so I've been doing a lot of privacy research over the last 10 years, looking at everything from end users' perceptions of privacy, to how people respond to privacy violations, issues around privacy and ethical considerations for new technology, building different types of privacy preserving tools, as well as digital literacy and building tools to teach about privacy and security. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on those last two bullet points around how do you help, especially children, but also families develop digital literacy when it comes to privacy, security, and technology, as well as thinking about curriculum and other opportunities to help folks learn. This work is in collaboration with several folks. These are some of my collaborators, both at the University of Maryland, the University of Chicago, Priya. Kumar was a PhD student of mine who is now at Penn State University. So why don't we dig right in? This is data from two projects. The first one was an IMLS grant, which if you're not familiar is Museum and, and Library Services, called Safe Data Safe Families. This project wrapped up in June of this year. We have an ongoing project through NSF called Security and Privacy Education for Kids. And this is specifically a NSF education grant within the secure and trustworthy computing space. And the goals of both of these projects was around developing resources, training, and other materials to teach different groups of people about privacy and security. So when we think about the main categories of problems that these two projects are addressing, I think there are three categories that are tied to technology access how technology is used in schools, and how lessons about privacy and security are framed. So when we think about technology access, we know that there is widespread low digital literacy, not just among younger people, but across all ages. Technology tends to evolve much faster than our ability to process it and learn. So we're always playing a game of catch up. In many families or in school systems, there's a reliance on public or shared devices. This could be having to use a public library. This could be having Chromebooks that are being shared in schools. And in general, privacy and security are not prioritized in conversations about technology use. When we think about schools in particular, we can't assume that teachers have a strong understanding of technology. And so there's going to be a lot of variation and many teachers who aren't tech savvy. I think the pandemic placed significant strain on teachers for many reasons, but among those was suddenly having to learn how to master all of these new technologies. And beyond the pandemic, there is an increasing reliance on technology in the classroom. So this is something that this is a quote problem that isn't going away. Many of the lessons don't span home and school context, and this is a motivation for our NSF grant, is thinking about ways to help kids learn about many of these topics that can be reinforced from their daily experiences with technology. And then finally, when we think about the ways in which lessons around privacy and security that already exist are framed, Many of them provide a checklist of do's and don'ts. So don't share your password. Do make your password strong. They don't, however, often explain to people as to why they should and shouldn't be doing different things. And I think that's an important piece of this. Many of the existing resources are also geared toward older children. So in our NSF project, we're specifically focusing on elementary school children who are still using technology, who still face privacy and security risks. And therefore, we should be thinking about how do we start having those conversations with them. So the methods that we use for these two projects, we used a various variety of methods. With our Safe Data, Safe Families project, we used focus groups with library staff from around the U.S. A big part of that project was happening in libraries. We did interviews with low-income families from around the state of Maryland. Then we also did participatory design, both with library staff, but also with children through Kids Team, which I'll talk about more in a moment. For the Speak project, we've done interviews with teachers and parents, 
focus groups with teachers and participatory design with children. So now I'm gonna break up the main chunk of the presentation into three areas. Our work that has been focusing on designing for children, designing for teachers and designing for library staff. So I'm gonna start with designing with and for children. And this is work that happened between, it's actually 2017 is when we started through 2021. So when we were thinking about how do we design some of these resources for children, we were initially inspired by the two projects I've listed on this slide. So the Watchers was a hybrid board and computer game developed by Kate Raines Goldie and colleagues. This helped players learn how websites collect information and use it for marketing. The second was a interactive ebook called Cyber Heroes by Zen Kennedy and colleagues. And this used a superhero motif, as you can see in that adorable picture, uh, and multiple elements, well, excuse me, multimedia elements to teach children lessons related to personal information, online chatting, location sharing, cyberbullying, and passwords. We extended this prior work by using the cooperative inquiry method to evaluate and co-design game and story-based resources with children to better understand the design space for teaching children about privacy and security online. If you're not familiar with cooperative inquiry, this is a participatory design method where adults and children work as design partners to create technologies with and for children. And in our case, we at the UMD are lucky enough to have Kids Team as part of the HCIL. Kids Team is an intergenerational design team that mixes adults. So these are the folks who, like Beth Bontenier, who runs it, as well as student volunteers who also work, and children uh, that usually spend a couple years being part of Kids Team. These are kids ages six to 14. They learn all about the design process and then we work with them. They have sessions twice a week. So in this project, we focused on the question I have on this slide. How can co-designing games and interactive narratives with children inform the development of privacy-focused educational resources? And I'm gonna go through several examples of things that resulted from our working with Kids Team as part of both projects. And so in 20, late 2017 into early 2018, we ran four sessions with Kids Team. And in our second session, we brought to them a low fidelity prototype based off of an existing popular game at the time, which was called Doodle Jump. Our prototype was Privacy Doodle Jump. So we just modded the existing version of it. Doodle Jump, uh, I'm assuming most of you have never played Doodle Jump, was a platform scroller. So, uh, you know, platform scrollers are like constantly moving either left to right or up and down. In Doodle Jump, you're continually jumping up on from platform to platform to try to get the highest score. Our goal with developing this prototype was to get ideas and engage the children from Kids Team in learning about privacy. We added a number of features to the game in our low fidelity prototype based on the first session we had had with kids team. And so when we looked at privacy doodle jump, we had things like customization options and badges, as well as power ups added. So in this, you can see in the top picture on the left uh, examples of some of the badges that you could get. And there were power ups like the rocket jet rocket that's on the blue platform where that could then shoot you up a far distance. We also interspersed the gameplay with some multiple choice questions that connected to broader privacy and security concepts. So in this one, it's Arthur is on the computer when suddenly an advertisement for a free Xbox game pops up. Sweet. All Arthur has to do is enter his mom's credit card number. It says it's free. What should he do? And then you pick your answer, A, B, C, or D. And if you get the correct answer, you get to proceed. Maybe you get a power up. If you get the incorrect answer, you might get another chance or the game might end in that case in this low fidelity prototype. So here we have, oops, your answer is incorrect and it tells you why versus what happens when you get the question right. So we ran this during the session. We got a lot of useful feedback from the kids during the session. And over the next several months, we developed a working prototype 
with an undergraduate student at U Chicago. And I'm going to play this just to kind of walk through of what it looks like. like. Audited, audited, but oh, right. Okay. Yeah. But, so, like, I'll just die right now. Okay. Um, so then, in this case. So that's you answered correctly. Right. And, and then, then these are like the power ups that I have in mind, but um, I'll just lose a gun. Let me try to. It's quite hard to die in this game. Yeah. So I think I do. I'll, I will have to. So you can see in this prototype that we developed, it was taking place inside of a computer or, you know, had that tech feel to it. And it still retained a lot of the classic features of Doodle Jump with it being an scrolling platformer. And if you fall into the lava pit or <laughs> whatever you would call that, uh, that's when a question would pop up. And the idea here is the question is helping you from dying from the game ending. Some of the kind of main takeaways that we used from our work with kids team in developing, this is listed as Cyber Monkey, the I can't remember if the if we decided on Cyber Monkey or Cyber Not. We went back and forth between that. But you know, these main takeaways, if you include customization features, kids are more likely to stay engaged with the game. When you integrate educational components into games, this is this is probably the trickiest part. And we got a lot of feedback from kids about this and how they don't like some kids said, you know, how can you take a perfectly good game and make try to make it educational? Uh, but the more you can make those elements seamless and part of the gameplay, the quiz question popping up being a lot of text for the kid to read was seen as problematic. So an example of how this could be changed is maybe you have a question like in this uh, screenshot on the right, where you say pick the stronger password and they're actually not stopping in the gameplay. They're just as they're bouncing up the platforms, they go to the left or to the right. And that is, that is seen as, as a better integration by the kids and kids team. And then finally, Expanding beyond educational, expanding the educational components beyond the questions to reinforce lessons. And so, you know, just slapping some of these features onto the existing doodle jumps seems a bit disjointed. And so thinking about ways to add additional components and whether that's something like making it more have a more techie feel to make kids already thinking about technology when we're asking them questions about technology makes more sense. Okay. That was example one. Example two is thinking about choose your own adventure. And maybe you read these stories when you were a kid. Choose your own adventure stories have a plot line and you get to some point in the plot and you are given multiple paths. So maybe you can, you know, make one decision or another. And then the story changes depending on your choice. So we covered this in our third and fourth kids team sessions to try to figure out whether a choose your own adventure style story would be useful to cover some of these concepts related to privacy and security. And to do this during kids team, we used an app that I love called POP, which stands for prototyping on paper. So let me show you how this works. See, that's a very brief overview. We did this on iPads with the kids, but the idea is you can sketch on paper what an app screen would look like, and then you take pictures of it and in, put them in the app, and then you can highlight areas to link so that you can actually click on these drawings of what the app would look like, and it takes you to other screens. So it was just a really nice way to create an interactive prototype at relatively, relatively easy for the kids to pick it up. Um, so we held one session where we focused on teaching the child design partners how to use the app. And we had them write their own story about how kids do things online. And then during the second session, we actually did this in practice. So we gave them some basic 
ideas for the story that they wanted to write, but we said they had to include two questions in the story. We said, would you like to switch on your location settings so it's possible to know where you are? And would you like to store your password so you don't have to type it in in the future? So their stories could be about anything as long as they included those two paths as part of it. The kids had a ton of fun with this activity. I really enjoyed it. They came up with some great story ideas, although maybe strangely, maybe not. Many of them included very grim outcomes for kids who (laughs) made wrong choices, uh, including death, kidnapping, and burglary. So these kids had very active imaginations. But we had these three main takeaways I have on this slide from our work with the kids in this activity. So first, we found that what resonated with the kids was creating stories that made sense and were part of their everyday lives. So this could mean using relatable characters from a sports team. One of the kids was a really big New York Giants fan. So he made his story around that, Um, as well as including apps and games they like to play. So Roblox was really popular among the kids and kids team and Instagram was popular among some of them. Beyond that, customization came up again. And this was by letting the reader become the main character by entering their name at the start of the story. So, you know, the choose your own adventure became your adventure. These ideas can help children feel more invested in the material and more receptive to messages. So we think that kind of customization is a really useful component of doing this design. Next, we found that resources work better at achieving our goal if they focus more on developing decision-making skills rather than offering that checklist. And we I mentioned that at the start of the talk, that that is one of the weaknesses of much of the security and privacy advice geared toward younger people right now is that they tend to be checklists. We, we make this argument because privacy and security decisions are often not black and white. There might be multiple correct answers. And so making sure that any type of resource, including the story, walks kids through these decisions and maybe talks about consequences of various decisions can help reinforce the concept and give it more meaning. The third thing, so it became clear from the way our child design partners immediately associated online behaviors with extreme outcomes. So, you know, posting your location online means that somebody's going to show up 30 minutes later and kidnap you. This suggests to us that the lessons that kids are getting tend to dramatize or use kind of these extreme examples to scare children. And again, that's problematic because that's not the way reality works. It's important for kids to know what risks are out there, but just because they're young doesn't mean that they can't have conversations about what the actual implications are and the kind of more nuance that happens when we make these decisions online. So let me move on to another manifestation of this. So in our other project, this came out of the IMLS project, and this is something we developed earlier this year. And the Choose Your Adventure story experience with kids team from 2018 was kind of still resonating in the back of my head when we did I believe three more sessions this winter with kids team. And one of the products that came out of that was a choose your own adventure story that is complete and interactive. And whenever I talk about any of the developed resources in this talk, they're all available on safedata.umd.edu. And if you go to that website and you navigate to resources for families, which is in the top right, you'll be able to access all of this. So Marco's surprise party is actually geared at middle school aged children. And it incorporates a lot of the elements that we were thinking about back when we were working with kids team in 2018 and walks you through a story where you are throwing a surprise party for your best friend. It's the day of the party. You still have a bunch of stuff to do and you need to make sure they, Marco, doesn't find out about the party. And so you're navigating through many decisions as you go to the mall to do things. Marco's texting you to make sure that that he doesn't find out. We also took a lesson from our earlier kids team sessions where kids really don't like to read a lot of text. Even if they're completely, you know, 100% good at reading, they'd rather listen. And so we added audio to this where you can either read or you can listen. 
So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. Okay, the third example of designing for children and with children I want to talk about is Password Mania. So this is a card game that was designed through working with kids team earlier this year. And we thought a card game could be easy, an easy way to teach kids about some of the basics of password strengths. And so from our sessions with kids team and getting feedback from them, we developed Password Mania. This is a card game that if you're really interested in this, I can give you a card deck. I have them in my office, but it focused on five types of cards. So it's a 72 card deck. Three main categories of password strengths are included. So these are three categories of cards, length. So how long your password is. A longer password gives you more points in the game characters so whether your password has a combination of letters and numbers like in the example card whether it's let letters numbers and symbols whether it's just letters or numbers give you less points and then content so what is actually the the content of your password your birthday you get no points your name you get no points complex passwords that have multiple words are giving you more points we also included two other elements, two types of cards to you know, add some fun to the game. So there's wild cards, much like you would see in other card games. I know I was inspired by some of the card games that I play with my family. And bonus cards highlight three different types of activities that you can do that increase your password security. We had one two-factor authentication, using a password manager, and uh, adding a security question. So the idea here is that you get dealt five cards, you take turns going around like in a normal card game, you're trying to build a hand with the most points, you see the point values in the top right, and we have two versions of the game, one which is geared at kind of either the first time you're playing or, or the younger kids, where it's just focused on points, and a more advanced version of the game where it's actually you're trying to build a legitimate password, so in that you can only have one character card, one content card, and then as many lens cards as you want, because that's just making the password longer and you can have bonus cards. So our current plans with this, we worked with kids team to develop it. We sent it out for feedback from people who do security research. And our next plan with this, now that we have the game printed, is to do some work in the classroom and potentially at libraries. But uh, with our NSF grant, we actually are working with two elementary schools. So we're going to be designing a curriculum around this to introduce the concept of passwords, which all kids at this point are familiar with, have them play the game and then have some kind of assessment where we can see, is this game actually effective at helping kids learn more about what makes a password strong? Okay, the fourth example, I think I have two more in the kids section. This also came from the work we did with kids team this spring. And maybe you have done a escape room in person, you know, where you have a series of rooms and you have puzzles or challenges that you need to solve to escape. We've seen other examples. Uh, I believe folks at UW have done a virtual escape room around misinformation, and we were inspired by that. And working with kids team, we developed Island Escape. This is a Google Forms based escape room that is geared toward elementary school students. So we're thinking grades three to five here. And in the story, you wake up on the beach, you have a note in your hand saying you need to get to the other side of the island, but the bad guys are after you. So you need to make sure that they can't find you as you're trying to get to the other side and get on the helicopter to get off the island. And so as you go through the Google Forms, it gives you story but it also gives you various multiple choice questions that are related. So the first one, for example, is like you approach a gated area and there's a note on the gate saying, you know, they made a strong password, but they stupidly wrote it down. And here's a list of four passwords. Which one do you think is the one that they used? And you enter in your response, A, B, C, D. And if you get it wrong, you have the opportunity to re-answer. And then if you get it right, the story progresses and it tells you more information about why the one answer is correct and the others are wrong. The final thing I wanna mention in terms of designing for children is a very straightforward example. This is a password worksheet. And this is something that was more indirectly inspired by Kids Team. We had just done a session with Kids Team we had you know, debriefed as a team to talk about 
the session and I just had this in, you know moment of like oh this is a really good idea and this is inspired by an XKCD comic which talks about password strength and the idea that it talks about is taking four words that are not connected to each other and making you know pushing them together and thinking about what could be a story to help me remember that so that gets at password length the most important factor in a strong password and the other factor of making a password memorable to you, but not easily guessable. So in the XKCD comic, it's horse, staple, battery. Oh gosh, I'm blanking on what the other one. But it's like, we could easily do this in a worksheet. So the worksheet is an example uh, of this. I have three different versions with different pictures. And then in the activity, you tell the child, pick four of these random words and then write a story about it. And so, again, that's reinforcing this idea of making passwords memorable and long, but hard for others to guess. If you want to download those, you can download them on the Safe Data website. Okay, so that was my whirlwind tour of our resources that we've done so far for children. Let me shift now to talk about teachers. And this is work that we have done from 2018 to the present. And this is a big piece of what we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. So we first asked the very basic question, what do elementary school teachers think about privacy and security in the classroom? We wanted to understand how much current elementary school teachers were engaging with this thought process because it is not a part of the established curriculum, but technology is obviously something that is increasingly incorporated. And teachers are actually have a lot of surveillance power over students, especially when the students are using Chromebooks or other technology in the classroom. So from the paper that we had, uh, we had a paper, Kai, in 2019, and I've included the citation on this slide. We had three main takeaways here. Educators first interpreted privacy and security as their need to responsibly manage student data login credentials. So this is literally some teachers had a list with each student name and the password for, you know, their tablet or whatever that they were using in the classroom. In most of the districts, students were given a username and password that they couldn't change. And these types of policies were often made at the district level. So individual teachers in the classroom had often no power to do this. So if it was a really bad password, weak password, like the teacher could do nothing about it. This was especially difficult for the teachers who worked with younger kids in kindergarten, first grade. They often lost their passwords. It was often, you know, a tremendous amount of time in the first part of the lesson to get everybody set up and logged into their device. Educators had to balance, therefore, you know, security and privacy concerns with students' developmental abilities, because in the end, you need to teach the lesson. And so it might make sense if you are able to reset a password to make it something really simple. So this highlighted to us how important it would be that any type of curriculum we developed started simple and became more complex as the students moved through elementary school. Our second theme that we thought was really useful for our project was that educators connected privacy and security with their desire to minimize inappropriate use of technology. So for example, they wanted to make sure students didn't accidentally or on purpose access adult material. So they all have a tablet, they're asked to search something in Google and you wanna make sure that they're not, their search term isn't bringing up images or links to websites that are problematic for their age. So, They used a wide range of tools in the classroom to try to control what students could access and to monitor their use of technology. There was tremendous variance across all of the teachers that we talked to about how they did this. And also it was, there's also a lot of variance in terms of how the district, at the district level, they managed what apps teachers could use. And some teachers just didn't know, but there seemed to be a lack of clarity as to how that process happened. And then third, uh, our conversations revealed some tensions between the teachers and the parents in terms of who should be responsible for teaching kids about privacy and security. So teachers felt these are the things that things are things parents should teach to their kids, although they recognized digital literacy mattered and not all parents maybe were confident in teaching their kids this. And we had previously talked to parents the year before. And when we talked to them, they said they wanted these concepts covered in school. 
Although there's kind of a big caveat there where we were talking to parents of elementary school teachers and many of them said, this is something that's important for the kids to learn, but not until they're older. You know, meanwhile, the kids, they hand their kids their smartphone and let their kids kind of like do whatever they want on their smartphone. So there was a bit of a disconnect there. So from this initial work that we did, we wrote up an NSF proposal that was accepted and began in February of 2020. And in that, we proposed to assess this and to develop curriculum based on something that we call the connecting learning context across home and school framework or the connecting context framework. And so we use this framework over the next several years to develop privacy and security tools and resources across three different groups. So teachers, children, and their parents. And to connect that learning between the two main contexts in which kids are operating and learning, home and school. So we are developing professional development and curriculum for the teachers. We're going to be working with parents to figure out what types of resources they need, what would be most useful to them, in terms of helping them better support their children. And obviously the kids themselves are gonna be participating in the curriculum. And we partnered with two schools, one in Prince George's County, Maryland, and one in Chicago where our co-PI Marsh Chetty is located. So when we are developing this curriculum and the project was as many projects significantly set back by the pandemic. And so we are, only now starting to do work where we think we'll be able to get into the classrooms and start doing curriculum later this academic year. But the idea here is that we will not make major curriculum changes, which is difficult, if not impossible at schools, but focus on developing what we call micro lessons. And so these are very short pieces of curriculum that a teacher can insert into a lesson that lasts 10 to 15 minutes. And the idea is these will be grouped around four main topic areas, a broad category around the internet, a category around privacy, around security, and then another broad category around digital citizenship. And that's the one that probably exists already and is established already to the greatest degree because there's a lot of content around both being a good digital citizen and how that evolves into what kids learn about bullying and harassment online. The idea here is that these micro lessons will fall into different grade bands and will get more complex and build on each other as kids move from kindergarten and grade one up until grade five. So if you look at the different cells in this table, if we look at privacy, when we start in you know, kindergarten and grade one, very basics about what does privacy mean online? What does it mean offline? And then as they uh, get a bit older, we can talk about data sharing, how data persists over time and across devices and the effect that has on privacy. And then as they get into the upper grades of elementary school, we could talk about more advanced things like tracking, ads, data ownership, and social media. Of course, I should note that with any of this, the crucial piece and the thing that I assume we'll be iterating on over the next couple of years is what does that look like at an age relevance format that is going to resonate with the kids. So a lot of this is figuring out what are the things going on in kids' everyday lives that would be meaningful that we could tap into. So when we have been talking to teachers and parents, that's one thing that we've been trying to get to know better. What are the... <laughs> What are the various types of ways in which technology is being used by these kids that could be potentially problematic? So we've heard stories about kids turning on uh, making, you know, doing sharing widely within a school, like maybe sharing a photo, kids using TikTok or Musical.ly, which is the precursor to TikTok, to like make videos and post them while they're in school and things like that, that could be entry points into these lessons and would resonate more with the kids. So I will say that this is, this is the most kind of ongoing in progress work. And so if people have thoughts or feedback on this, this is something where we haven't fully developed what this curriculum is going to look like, but we'll see a lot of progress in the next two years with this project. Okay, the thing I want to end on here is the work that we did working with library staff. And this was between 2017 and 2020. And 
when we are thinking about what are the ways in which library staff might benefit from different types of privacy resources, what we were really interested in was library staff's everyday interactions with patrons. And so there isn't necessarily a lot of guidance in most libraries' policies and procedures around these everyday interactions. There, there might be kind of higher level things, but when you're assisting a patron, all kinds of things could come up where the patron might hand you their phone and say, can you set up this account for me? Or they might shove tax documents in your hands and say, like, I need your help to do this, where the patrons are dealing with very sensitive data and li the library staff themselves have to be aware of liability issues. If I help this patron with their taxes and something's filed wrong and then they end up owing the government, the patron could very well blame me. And so like navigating that line between helping the patrons and making sure that they are not taking over and, and creating new risks is something that we addressed in the paper that I have linked here. The other thing that we found in talking to library staff is that patrons often don't have the time. So they come to you with a technology problem that might raise privacy risks, but they don't want to hear about that. They just want you to fix the problem. And so how do you use that as an opportunity to have a conversation with patrons without you know, them walking off is a challenge. As I mentioned, there are liability issues. And then of course, like teachers and like everybody else, we can't expect libraries to have to all be super tech savvy. So some libraries may have devoted tech staff. Many of the smaller branches don't, and, but they might have that one staff member who everybody knows is, is good with technology. But so thinking about what could we do to help staff be able to better address patron concerns. So what can we do in terms of training for them? We ended up developing a lot of resources. This is all on the safedata.umd.edu website under the resources for library staff. And the first thing that we designed based on our conversations with library staff and with families was what we call teaching moments. So the idea here is that when library staff are having everyday interactions, there might be these moments to bring in conversations or points around privacy and security. And so the idea was these types of teaching moments could be used during these interactions to help patrons learn about things. And this is an example of what the final kind of handouts look like. We have multiple versions of these in which we have about 15 different topic areas where there might be a privacy or security risk related to what the patron is trying to accomplish. And we designed an initial version of this, and then we went back to the library staff and we did focus groups with them. And we used, I can't remember if this is Miro board or Jamboard, I think this is Jamboard. And as part of that design session with library staff, we gave them these original versions we had developed and we gave them some prompts to brainstorm. So in this case, we asked them, how would you use a handout like this? Uh, and we got a lot of good feedback. And, you know, for example, what, something that was really helpful to us was this comment during one of the sessions, the current format is helpful tips that wouldn't necessarily work well in patron interactions. And they wanted more guidance on literally how to make that part of the conversation. So what we ended up doing is we ended up making an annotated version of these documents that are available to library staff. And so it includes still each of the original handouts with the tips, but then it provides advice to the, the library staff member about the ways in which they can, this can be integrated, including some, just some example language that they could say to the patron as they're interacting. And so that could be something just to help the staff member think about, well, if I want to help educate this patron, what might that look like? And so these are, these are one of the resources that we made available to staff. We also made a whole series of training for the staff. And we tried to vary the training based on length, based on whether it was individual, a large group, whether it was something that could be done online or had to be done in person. And a big component of this is all of the trainings revolve around personas. Personas are fictional characters that incorporate characteristics of a given population. And we develop these personas based on our interviews with 54 adults from these library branches across the state of Maryland. And we have, I want to say six or six to eight different personas. 
And this is an example one, Anthony. Uh, and the idea here is that they have varying goals with using technology, varying frustrations or risks. And then they also have, you know, we have these three examples on the right of their how much they use technology, how aware they are of different risks, and their digital literacy. And so in some of the trainings, the trainings have different goals, but in the trainings, you often work with one of these personas and a scenario, and either in a one-on-one -on -one situation or as a group, you talk through the best way to handle that situation. Another thing we did as part of this training is we recognize, obviously, we developed the personas based on the families we talk to, but there might be other types of library patrons that are very different from the personas. So we have one of our training modules is showing staff how to create their own persona, where they have multiple kind of conversations about what the needs are among their patrons and how they could incorporate this. And we, we have a blank template where they can build their own documents to use that in, in their training. The third thing we did with library staff was creating a patron-centered privacy policy framework. So this recognizes that the existing privacy policies that libraries have and the guidance that libraries have from the American Library Association is focused more on the kind of big picture of data being generated and data being shared by libraries and is less focused on these everyday interactions. So we develop this framework with six key areas where there might be privacy risks and walk through what are the key topics, what are the recommendations to include in a policy and examples of existing policy that might touch on that. So we spent several months doing reviews of existing policies from libraries across the U.S., both urban and rural, big and small. And we use that and the six main categories of, of topics that we included are on the slide. So there's just general concerns, financial information, public libraries are used very heavily for submitting financial forms like taxes, just general online forms, using third-party sites, special considerations for minors, and then using public computers and what the recommendations are. So we have, a, we have a guide that's available as a PDF, but also on the website, uh, the different sections, as well as tips for how libraries could communicate these policies to their patrons. Because it's one thing to have the policy, it's another to make sure the patrons are aware of what their policy is for data that they collect and use and what rights the patron has. So that is a quick summary of the research. What is coming up next? As I said, our ILS project wrapped up. We are uh, doing some additional training with library staff about how to incorporate the resources we developed. And uh, Mega Supermanium, my co-PI and I are thinking about you know, what the future looks like in terms of evaluating these, these resources we've developed to see how effective they are. We have made everything Creative Commons available and al allow people to adapt them to their own branches. So we're hoping to see what various branches are doing with our resources and how they're changing them to fit their needs. But the main focus for my uh, research in this space is going to be on that NSF grant over the next couple of years. And like I said, our biggest thing right now is working with teachers at the two elementary schools to develop the curriculum and then begin evaluating that curriculum. We also wanna have tech nights for parents. That's just something that came up from our conversations with teachers earlier this year that a lot of parents express interest in learning more about how technology works. Professional development is also something that is seen as not very good at covering these topics for teachers. And it's often like a one shot, you, know, you have to complete these modules at the start of every year. And they want something that's more ongoing, recognizing that privacy and security risks don't just disappear and that they evolve over time. So, so should training. And the overlapping goal of all of this work is making sure that we are connecting these home and school contexts involving both teachers and the parents, as well as obviously the children. So that is all I have, but I'm happy to have a wider conversation. I know I went through some of this stuff quite quickly. If you do want to download any of the papers, they're all available to download on my lab website, which is pearl.umd.edu. 
and you can always email me if you have any questions, but I'm happy. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions now. So oh yeah, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>